All right, so my sermon for this morning is going to be a little political, and I don't go there very often, but sometimes it's just, you know, when there's things going on that captures everybody's attention, I figure, hey, why not? It's a good, it's actually, when it's on everyone's mind, let's get a biblical perspective on things. Because it's easy to get caught up and wrapped up in the media and all this other stuff, and, and there's a lot of fear-mongering that goes on around this time of year, or every four years, you know, we've had a presidential election, and um, I like to remind people of what the Bible says during these times, because it's funny how every four years, this is the most important election of our lives. If we don't vote for whoever, <laughs> everything's going to be real. Life as you know it is not going to be the same. There's going to be doom and gloom. And both sides of the fence say this, right? It doesn't matter who you're, you're, you're interested in, if you're red or blue, if you're D or R, if you're on this team or that team. It's, this is just, this is the most pivotal and the most important in the existence of our country. You cannot, you know, get out there and vote and this and that. And I'm trying to bring a little bit of reason and sense to all the fear mongering and all the nonsense and garbage that's going on out there. Now, you don't have to agree with me on, on my philosophy, my mindset on voting and things like that, because I personally don't think it matters one bit who you vote for. Uh, in the end, I don't think the outcome matters. I think there's corruption that's gone so deep now that it really doesn't matter at all. And I think that's just being evidence this week. I don't believe the results for a second. And look, I'm not saying that because, oh, you're just a Trump supporter and you're upset that he didn't get... Uh, no, have you been listening to the sermons lately? Because <laughs> you'll see that I am not a Trump supporter. Okay, I just look at things and I like to know what the truth is. And when I see obvious problems, I could put two and two together and it's rigged. Okay. It's been rigged. It's been rigged for a long time. There's people in power that don't want to lose power and whatever. So, but I'm not going to get into all of that, right? All the reasons why I don't even, I don't think voting makes a difference one way or the other, or even why I don't choose to vote for evil. That whole philosophy of the lesser of two evils. Why would I vote for evil? And, you know, people go, oh, what do you expect a Baptist pastor to run for president? Or it's like, look, no, I don't, I'm not looking for, you know, it's funny because when you look at standards, right? I think we ought to have standards in a candidate of who you're going to choose to be a ruler in a country. The Bible gives us lots of standards of people that were ended up being rulers. We could go back to that. I'm not, we're not going to do that this morning. And, and how Moses selected and ordained rulers over the people. And they weren't all priests, right? They were just people, men of renown, people that were known, people who had integrity, people who were honest and good, and that's who the, you choose to be in charge and ruling people. I mean, is it really that hard? But when you've got people who are, are pro-abominations, I mean, we're talking about, look, we're all sinners, we're all guilty of things, no one's going to be perfect, but there's a huge difference between people who are, yeah, I've got some problems, but overall can just live with integrity and live by a set of morals and, and have like the Bible be their guide of truth versus people who are just going to, yeah, sodomy, no problem with it. Actually, I'm going to pander to, to perverts because I want them to vote for me or Abortion, death, murder, just legalized murder. No problem at all. And when you don't even have anybody that can, can, that can satisfy just two of some of the most basic, most basic morality, you know, passes. Don't tell me my standards are too high. I mean, is it too much to say I don't want an adulterer? I don't want a, a pedophile? I don't want people who support either one of those, okay? I, I don't want someone like that, someone that is in such moral rot and decay to be the leader of the country. So no, if one is a little bit better than another on some issues here or there, look, I don't want either of them, okay? But I'm not going to go into all that this morning. 
That's pretty obvious. I want, what I want to do is remind people who may be caught up in the nonsense, going, oh man, what are we going to do? This is crazy, or you know, whatever. And remind, first of all, the first point is that God will lift up and God will abase rulers in this world. Okay, so that's another one of the reasons why I think elections don't really matter. They don't really matter. Because God will put in place who he wants to be there anyways. I mean, you think you have all this power and all this voice, but at the end of the day, you know, there's someone higher than you. And there's someone higher than the Democrat and Republicans, and there's someone higher than even the, the forces of darkness that, that are in positions of power in this world. There's someone more powerful than them. And it's the Lord Almighty. And what we see here, we started in Daniel chapter 4, and actually there was a part of here, let me see if I could find it really quickly, um, that, I, that I wasn't going to cover, it wasn't the main point, but then what, during the reading I was like, <laughs> yeah, I should probably just bring that up real quickly because Daniel 4, we see, you know, obviously it's the story of Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar was, was you know, basically a, a, a ruler of a kingdom that, that spanned, there's like a, a world kingdom, essentially. He's a ruler of Babylon, right? And Babylon had conquered everyone. And he gets lifted up with pride. And he thinks that uh, he's the reason for being in charge and being in the position and everything else. But God has to remind him... Um, no, there it is. Verse 17. Look at verse number 17 real quick. But reads, This matter is by the decree of the watchers and in demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. So who is it that rules? God. And what does he do? He gives it to whoever he wants to give it to. He sets up people to be able to rule and reign. Right? And then look at this. I, I love this, this last phrase in that verse. And setteth up over it the basest of men. So you know what? If God's going to have a base person in charge, I'll let God, you know, do that. Obviously, what am I going to do against it? It doesn't matter even if I vote against it. If God wants to set up a base per base just means low, a vile person, someone who... I was just describing a moment ago, right? And those are our options. You know what? Apparently, God has decided to put up a base person to rule our country. Because those are the only choices, <laughs> choices that we had anyways. Right? They're base people. They're vile people. So this is what God decides to do. But... Let's jump down real quick to verse number 30. Cause, so, you know, in this story, Nebuchadnezzar has his dream. He doesn't understand the dream. And then Daniel comes and explains it to him and says, hey, look, here's what the dream means. It's against you. And it's going to explain. God just wants people to know that he is in charge. And from time to time, he needs to do this. When man gets too lifted up with pride, Nebuchadnezzar is too lifted up with pride. Now, God put him in charge for a purpose. For a reason, because he brought judgment upon people that God wanted judgment to be brought against. And just because God lifted him up, that doesn't mean that Nebuchadnezzar is a good guy. Just because God put him in that position doesn't mean, oh, what a godly person. It just means God's using him for his own purpose. Verse number 30, let's jump down to verse number 30 here. We'll see this in a, in a little bit more detail and context than just verse 17. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Right, so here, what is it? Me, me, me. Look how great I am. There's never been, there's never been a greater king than me. This is for the might of my majesty. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Look, I, I know I keep being a, a dead horse here, when, or, or a dead elephant, but um, what, <laughs> and, and don't take this the wrong way because I, you know, I, I've been slamming Trump a lot in my preaching, 
The reason why I don't even go after the, the pedophile is because I shouldn't, I don't even think I should have to in the house of God. People who have any knowledge of the Bible should know that like what, what that group stands for is so far removed from anything even close to, to Bible that it, you know, hopefully I shouldn't even have to get into, into all of that. Because yeah, it is bad, but you know what? The red's not any better. Or you could say slightly better in different areas. And here's the thing. What, what, what area are you going to say? Oh, but the economy, the economy. Well, would you rather have a lot of money and just, and just corrupt morals and wickedness running and abounding? Or would you rather not care about the economy and have somebody that can actually have the integrity and honesty to say, you know what, morals actually matter. Because if you just go after the money, you know, how... The Bible teaches from front to back that it's not about money. And if you want someone to lead you and guide you, who cares about the stupid money? Don't go sell out and support someone just to have more money, more stinking money. And that's what people do. You know, that's, that's one of the root of the problems anyways of this, of this evil choices. It's because you got people on one side of the aisle Got people promising, oh man, you don't have to work that much and we'll give you this and we got to support all these people that don't want to work and, and you know, we're going to expand all these benefits and we're going to make everything socialized and we're going to give you everything and it's the greedy people. It's all about what can I get, what can I have, what, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me and don't want to work for their own stuff, right? And, and choosing people off of money, what's going to benefit me financially if I, if I vote for this person or this person. And then on the other side, it's, oh, but this person understands the economy and they're going to get everything. It's money, 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 money. I don't care about either one of those. Look, I, I, I don't support just, just giving money away for, you know, to people who aren't going to work. And I also don't support just, well, forget all the morals because we're just going to make a bunch of money. Because you know what? If you're wicked, God's just going to take it all away anyways. So who cares? It's going to be gone. The judgment will come. So uh, let's, I'm sorry, let's keep reading. I forgot what verse did we leave off on verse 30? Did I read verse 30? He's, he's talking about his own might, his own power. Verse 31, while the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. See, just like that, in one moment, God's able to just say, you know what? You don't got the kingdom anymore. And people who are freaking out, oh, but it's going to be present. You know, if God wants to, that could be done in a moment. Amen, amen. It doesn't matter. That's right. yeah. But I think we're get, America is getting what they deserve. Amen. Amen. There's a reason why the rulers are put up and the things happen the way they do. Now, the sermon, too, just so you understand, I'm, I'm going to preach a two-part sermon, essentially. They're going to be different from each other, but this morning I'm just going over the, how the president is not the answer. Okay? Politics is not the answer. This is not what's going to save our country. It's not what's going to save us, save our people. It is, does not lie in the office of the presidency. Okay? And we're going to go through all the reasons why. The first one is just, well, God's going to lift up the rulers anyways. Okay, so don't be looking to them to be your savior. And then this evening, I want to preach more on what is going to work? What is the answer? What do we look to? How uh, it, can the country be turned around if it's even possible? What would be the right way to go? So this morning, I'm just exposing the wrong way, which is any faith in the presidency. And mind you, we're going to be looking at things this morning that talk mostly just deal with the kings, and we don't have a king. And people also tend to forget when you're talking about the importance of the election, there's a Congress, okay, that passes the laws. Our king, so-called, or president, is very, is somewhat, I mean, increasingly more, gets more power, but overall still, is, it's not like everything hinges on one person in our form of government either. So don't forget that. But when we look at verses that talk about kings, we don't have a king. So we're going to be looking at it under the lens of how does this apply to just rulers in general, right? Because there's some verses that are going to be more specific for kings in the Bible because a king is, is like almighty in the land. 
And that doesn't apply when you don't have a king in some cases. So we're going to just be looking at it, though, what can we learn from uh, the verses that talk about kings as just rulers in general. And the ones that, I, that we're going to be looking at should all apply in that manner. Well, let's keep reading here. Now, verse number 32, And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. So he basically is making... Nebuchadnezzar, like an animal, like a beast of the field. And when it says seven times, that's seven years. So because of his pride, God smites Nebuchadnezzar and abases him. He brings him down. So, I mean, how much lower can you be brought down than just behaving and acting and looking like an animal? Right? There's a, that's, that's a pretty low state to be in. There's, there's a big distinction between human beings and animals and God makes Nebuchadnezzar just like he's eating grass out in the field. I mean, we were driving to, to church this morning and there's, there's a property that has horses on it. And we always see these horses out. And what are they doing? They're out eating grass. Oh, it doesn't matter if it's raining or this morning, a little drizzle, whatever. And they're just out there and they're eating grass. And you know what? That's great for horses to do. But can you, can you imagine what it'd be like if, we, if we're driving by and we see horses and then we see a person out there chomping down on the grass right next to the horses, right? That would look ridiculous. It'd be kind of funny. And what a, what a shame that would be to just see somebody just out there in that condition and, and how low. Someone who was so high and mighty and respected and everyone, yes, sir, you know, and, and, and talked to with the utmost respect. Now you're seeing him eating grass and rolling around in the dirt and his hair literally becomes like, like eagle's feathers. Just from being out, you know, like that matty hair, just, just being out there. His nails are just grown. He's not keeping up with himself like a normal person would. So he's got like these claws and he just starts to look more and more like an animal because he's been outside for seven years. That's what God did to Nebuchadnezzar. And you know what? God's hand is not any shortened today than it ever has been. We need to remember that. Because if God chooses to, any of these people who think they're so powerful, things can change in an instant, in a moment, overnight. Verse number 33, the same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I bless the Most High, which is good. This is, this is the response that God wanted, right? When he finally, his, his mind, his sanity comes back to him, God gives that back to him. The first thing he does, he's going to recognize God. He says, I bless the Most High and I praise and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? At the same time, my reason returned unto me. And for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me. And my counselors and my Lord sought unto me. And I was established in my kingdom and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now, this is also interesting, too, because after seven years of acting like an animal and acting like a beast, God was still able to take that same person then and lift him back up to have the same status that he had before. Because you might think, well, after that, how could anyone come back from that? I mean, his opponents, his adversaries are going to have a field day with that. Oh, what are we going to have? This animal, this beast come back and, 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 you know, he's already blown it and we can't trust this guy or whatever. Well, God's able to bring him back and give him his position back if he wants to. God can lift people up out of the lowest place and he can bring people down from the highest place. I do think it's important to understand what's going on around us and not to be ignorant of what's going on around us. It's important what's going on. But let's keep a biblical perspective of just understanding who's in charge and follow the path that God would have us to follow. Fret over the things that God would have us fret about and don't fret over the things that he wouldn't have us fret about. And here's the thing, even when wicked people are in charge, like the pharaohs or Nebuchadnezzar's, and they're bringing oppression on people, well, you know what? If you're living right, guess who can deliver you from that? 
Guess who's going to save you from that? Guess who's going to hear your prayers and hear your cry? The Lord will. And then do you think it's going to matter at all how powerful that, that wicked person is? No. Because God could bring deliverance. And he will bring deliverance. And he has brought deliverance. He's proven himself over and over and over again. And we're going through the whole book of Psalms. And you can, you can listen in if you haven't been on the Wednesday night Bible studies. We'll see over and over and over and over again that the theme in the vast majority of them is God's deliverance. And it says in verse 37 there, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. Now, just because a king is established, I mentioned this already, it does not make him a good king. It doesn't mean, oh, yeah, great, God. You know, people are just like, oh, yeah, God gave us Trump and God bless us. You know, all this stuff. It's like, you don't realize he's not blessing us. <laughs> he's not, like, people get deceived into thinking that it is. And, I, and see what God may have done. God did do that. He set up the ruler. But it's probably not for the purpose you think so. In, uh, in Exodus Chapter 9, verse 16, we see an example of God raising up Pharaoh. And you don't have to turn there. Turn, if you would, to 2 Kings. 2 Kings 22. We're going to go through a lot on there. In Exodus 9, verse 16, the Bible says, And in very deed for this cause have I raised thee up, for to show... And this is, this is the word of the Lord speaking to Pharaoh. Okay, just in context of Exodus 9, 16. And in very deed for this cause have I raised thee up, for to show in thee my power and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. So he's telling Pharaoh, I raised you up to be in this position right now for my own benefit, for my own glory, so that the whole world is going to know that there's a Lord in heaven. That's why you're in the position you're in right now, because Pharaoh is full of pride too. Who is the Lord? He thinks he's there because he's so great, and he can abuse whoever he wants, and there's going to be no repercussions because who is the Lord anyways? And God said, you know what? The only reason you're in that position is because I wanted you to be in that position so that everyone can see how mighty and powerful I really am and that there is a God of the earth and there is a God of heaven. And it's the Lord. Now, so that doesn't, just because God establishes the rulers doesn't make those rulers good people. In fact, he often will bring the basis of men to be the rulers. So what is it that marks a good ruler? Because again, if you're going to look at different rulers, well, who's going to be a good ruler and why do I keep bagging on the, the, the so-called choices that we have? Well, a good ruler is marked by wisdom. And you see this in the book of Proverbs. And I'm going to read a couple to you. Proverbs 8, you could stay in 2 Kings. Proverbs 8, verse 12, the Bible reads, I wisdom dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty invention. So in Proverbs 8, wisdom is being personified. Just as we keep reading here, wisdom is personified. It says, I, wisdom. So now all the things we're going to see here is with that context in mind about wisdom being the narrator. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding, I have strength. This is wisdom speaking, right? I am understanding, I have strength. By me, kings reign and princes decree justice. By wisdom, kings reign. By wisdom, princes decree justice. True justice, right? By, you have to have wisdom in order to bring justice, right? Otherwise, you have wicked people in charge, you're not going to have justice because they're warped, they're twisted, they don't care about what's right and what's just. But if they have wisdom, then they can bring justice. By me, princes rule and nobles, even all the judges of the earth. And it's talking about ruling, there. it's talking about ruling well, it's talking about ruling the way that God would have them rule. You need wisdom. So, if wisdom is so important for judges to rule, for kings to rule, for princes to rule, and to bring justice, what is the beginning of wisdom? Fear of the Lord. It's so simple. If we read our Bibles, the Bible's telling us, man, you know, if you're going to have a ruler that's going to have justice, if you're going to have a ruler that's going to be a good ruler, they need to be wise. They need to have wisdom. And if they don't have the beginning of wisdom, the very first step, 
the fear of the Lord, why am I going to think they're going to be a good ruler and they're going to bring justice and they're going to do anything right that's going to be good for a godly nation? And let me tell you, Biden and Trump, they don't have the fear of the Lord. Neither one does. Neither one does. Okay? Occasionally, they'll give lip service to the Bible or to a Christian base of people. But you can see by their lives, by their actions, by their choices, by what they do, they are not God-fearing people at all. God-fearing people don't praise weirdos and perverts. Proverbs 20, 26 says, A wise king scattereth the wicked and bringeth the wheel over them. Have we seen the wicked have the wheel brought over them in the past four years? I haven't seen it. Where, where is the destruction of the wicked that a, that a so-called righteous, wise ruler is going to bring in? The Bible says that a wise king scattereth the wicked. I don't think the ruler has been very wise. Because I don't think he has a fear of the Lord. And I don't see that in the next ruler either. So if you're wondering, Pastor Bruce, why didn't you go out and vote? Well, one, it doesn't matter. And two, I just want to at least have someone who has the beginning of wisdom. Is that too much to ask? Even the beginning. Like, like we just had that as the standard, the beginning of wisdom. Like, like just start down here at the lowest level. Let's just start giving, getting wise. Do you fear the Lord? Because then there might be hope for you to increase in your wisdom. And your knowledge. Just, just start with the fear of the Lord. Oh, you don't even have that? Pfft. I'm not going to waste my time. I had you turn to 2 second, er, second Kings We're going to see a great story here of actually a really good ruler, a really good king by the name of Josiah. And how even with an ideal candidate, even with an ideal ruler, oftentimes even that's not enough to save a country. Josiah is a ruler that is like Man, if there wasn't a, a Josiah around, I'd be excited about that. And we'll see why. He exhibited wisdom. He exhibited fear of the Lord. He exhibited all the traits that we see here. And it'd be like, man, can, can we just have someone like... And, and you know what? Was Josiah a pastor? No. Was he a priest? No. He was just a king. He was, in, he was in a kingly line by heredity, became king. He was a layman, if you will, but someone that feared the Lord. You know, people always want to take things to the extreme and say, oh, you have such high standards. Why aren't you voting? You know, people get all, so the Fox News Baptists get all upset that you're not voting for Trump. Like, well, what do you expect? You want to have just, the, you know, the most godly person? Well, yeah, I would like to have that, but you know what? That's not where my standard is either. How about a Josiah? Is that asking too much? It, I mean, it seems to be now these days, you know, but Josiah wasn't a priest. He wasn't a pastor. He wasn't anything like that. But you know what? He feared the Lord. And it showed in his actions. And it lines up that he was wise with the rest of Scripture. But let's, so let's, let's look through this. We're going to spend a little bit of time here in 2 Kings 22 and 23. Verse number 1 of 2 Kings 22, the Bible reads, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 30 and one years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jedidah, the daughter of Adiah of Bozkath. And he did that which was right 
in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the way of David his father and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. So he's being reputed here as being a good king. And as you read through Kings and Chronicles, you'll see there's some good kings, some bad kings, and the, and the Bible kind of tells you who's good, who's not good, who's following in the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and who's following in the way of David, right? Those are kind of the two standard bearers of, of right and wrong when it comes to comparison of, of these kings. So Josiah did that which was right. He's just like David, right? He's got a heart for God, and he's not turning aside to the right hand or left. He's, he's walking that straight and narrow and keeping things with integrity. Jump down to verse number 16. The Bible reads, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the words of the book which the king of Judah hath read. So in between these verses, basically what you have is, is Josiah just has this heart. He wants to serve the Lord. He wants to rebuild the, the house of God. He, he has his good intentions. And then they, they come across this Bible, right? They come across the book of the law and someone dusts it off and brings it to him and say, hey, look what we found when we were repairing the house and we were getting things up because, you know, he's like, wow, cool, look at that. So you read it and he's like, oh man, we're in deep trouble. Because he actually just has an honest heart when he hears the word of God going, I believe what that says. I believe the Lord. And now, we, now we've got a serious issue. So he goes and, and, and goes to consult and seek the word of God and, and what he needs to do because of the, the trouble that they're in right now. So God says he's going to bring evil upon this place, upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the words of the book which the king of Judah read, verse 17, because they have forsaken me and have burned incense on other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath shall be kindled against this place and shall not be quenched. So God's saying, judgment's coming. You guys have abandoned me. You, you made me angry. So judgment is coming. And I'm going to go into this a little bit more tonight, but that's the situation that the United States of America is in. America's making God angry every day and increasingly more and more angry. And it's the people. It's not just, oh, well, that's Obama's fault. That's why God's angry. No. Where did the, the people are getting what they deserve with someone like that. It's the, it's the people who are making God angry. Verse 18 says, But to the king of Judah, which sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall you say to him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, As touching the words which thou hast heard, because thine heart was tender, and thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord, when thou heardest what I spake against this place, and against the inhabitants thereof, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and hast rent thy clothes and wept before me, I also have heard thee, saith the Lord. Behold, therefore I will gather thee unto thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered into thy grave in peace, and thine eyes shall not see all the evil which I will bring upon this place. And they brought the king word again. So God hears this righteous king. And he's going he's gonna to stay off judgment for that. Doesn't, doesn't just get rid of it. There's no way of getting rid of the judgment at this point. They've already, gone, they've already gone reprobate when it comes to God's judgment coming on the country. That even the best king that you could possibly ask for isn't good enough to undo all of the wickedness that's already been done. And I'm going to show you a little bit more tonight why I think that's the state that we're in today. That even if we had the best choice possible in a president or in a rulers of our, of our country, that we've, we've, already, we've already tipped the scales, that judgment is going to come. But we don't have that in charge anyway, so we'll never, we'll never know unless we actually would have a Josiah step up. Let's go to chapter 23. Because now we're going to see, God tells Josiah there's doom and gloom ahead. So does Josiah just throw up his hands and say, okay, well then forget it, then I just quit. No. He still lives right and, and acts according to what he's supposed to do. So we can look at this world and say, oh, well, forget it all, just nuts to it. No, we still do what we're supposed to do, regardless of even if you know a short-term outcome, even if you know the long-term outcome, you still do what you're supposed to do. And you don't just throw up your hands. God grants him a respite, which is a great blessing, because of his stand. And you know what? We would probably see the same thing. If Josiah rose up, we could at least probably enjoy a little bit 
prolonged peace and prosperity for a short time until the judgment came. But, you know, the judgment's ultimately going to come. Look at verse 20, or chapter 23, verse 1. Now we're going to see the actions of a righteous king, a righteous ruler. Verse number 1, And the king sent, and they gathered unto him all the elders of Judah and of Jerusalem. And the king went up into the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him, and the priests, and the prophets, and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant, which was found in the house of the Lord. So what's the first thing he does? Bring honor and glory to God. So you know what? We need to go by this book right here. Like I said, he wasn't a priest, he wasn't a prophet, he was a king. He's a political leader, but you know what he does? He says, we need to give reverence to the Lord. And here's the law, and here's the book, and here's our guidance, and here's our wisdom. This is going to be the law of the land. This is what we're going to do from here on out. And the people had strayed. You say, oh, but they already had those. You know what? Those laws had changed because different kings come in and wicked kings allow for different things. And, and, they, and you know, when they, especially when they're setting up all these altars of false gods and everything else, that wasn't part of God's law. That wasn't allowable or acceptable or tolerable. But it had become that way. So Josiah comes in and radically changes things. Verse number three says, And the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all their heart and all their soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book and all the people stood to the covenant. Yeah, a political leader saying, we are going to follow this book. Amen. Because that's where wisdom lies. Verse 4, And the king commanded Hilkiah the high priest and the priests of the second order and the keepers of the door to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal and for the grove and for all the hosts of heaven. And he burned them without Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron and carried the ashes of them unto Bethel. So the first thing he does, he's stamping out the wicked, false gods out of the land. That's what a righteous king does, a righteous ruler. Verse 5, And he put down the idolatrous priests, whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places in the city of Judah. So we see previous kings had set up these wicked false prophets into places of prominence and say, oh yeah, we need you burning incense here. And here. Josiah comes along and says, no. I don't care that that was the law. We're, making, we're, we're changing things up here. We're going after the law of the Lord. Right now, obviously, kings have more authority to do this thing than in, in our you know, system of governance that, that we're under right now. But we're just looking at what is it that even a good ruler would stand for, right? Even if they didn't have the power to do all these things, like, like someone who at least gave the lip service, but no, he's the one that does it. And the Bible says um, here, and he put down the idolatrous priest, whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places in the cities of Judah and in the places round about Jerusalem, them also that burn incense unto Baal, to the sun, and to the moon, and to the planets, and to all the hosts of heaven. And he brought out the grove from the house of the Lord without Jerusalem unto the brook Kidron, and burned it at the brook Kidron, and stamped it small to powder, and cast the powder thereof upon the graves of the children of the people. And he brake down the houses of the Sodomites that were by the house of the Lord, where the women wove hangings for the grove. So now he's going and, and driving out the Sodomites. It's what a righteous king does. And they were right by the house. He's like, get out of here. You have no business being here. He drives them out, breaks down their houses, right? Comes in with a battering ram going, you're evicted, you know, get out. And verse 8 says, And he brought all the priests out of the cities of Judah and defiled the high places where the priests had burned incense from Geba to Beersheba and break down the high places of the gates that were in the entering in of the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city, which were on a man's left hand at the gate of the city. Nevertheless, the priests of the high places came not up to the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem, but they did eat of the unleavened bread among their brethren. And he defiled Topheth, which is the valley of the children of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or his daughter to pass through the fire to Molech. Child sacrifices, child murder. Near the beginning of the sermon, you know, I brought up two points about wicked rulers and how we have people who are supporting filth, abomination, sodomy, homosexuality, right? 
and abortion, which is child murder. Right. It's child sacrifice to self. Instead of the idol being Moloch, it's the individual being Moloch because, oh, I can't deal with this. Oh, I'm not ready to have this in my life right now. Oh, how am I going to feel? What am I going to do? So you're just going to sacrifice that child for you, for your betterment. And tell me that's not why people have abortions. No concern for the child. I'm just going to offer this up on the sacrifice and altar of me because I don't want this. It's wicked as hell. Amen. What does the righteous ruler do? We're stopping that practice right now. What does the righteous ruler do? Sodomites, you're evicted. Get out of here. Drive the sodomites out of the land. Stop the child sacrifice. This is what righteous rulers do. You're going to tell me we have a right, we've had a righteous ruler in the past lifetime? No, not in my lifetime. Any of the elder people in here have had that in their lifetime? No, didn't think so. Verse 11, he took away the horses that the kings of Judah had given to the son at the entering in of the house of the Lord by the chamber of Nathan Melech, the chamberlain, which was in the suburbs and burned the chariots of the sun with fire and the altars that were on the top of the upper chamber of Ahaz, which the kings of Judah had made and the altars which Manasseh had made in the two courts of the house of the Lord. Did the king beat down and break them down from thence and cast the dust of them into the brook Kidron? And the high places that were before Jerusalem, which were on the right hand of the Mount of Corruption, which Solomon, the king of Israel, had builded for Ashtoreth, the abomination of the Zidonians, and for Chemosh, the abomination of the Moabites, and for Milcom, the abomination of the children of Ammon, did the king defile. Look, it doesn't matter how old these things were, because at this point, they were very old relics going back to Solomon. Solomon was a great king, except in the end, he did a lot of wicked things when he reared up these altars. And look at how long that influence lasted over the children of Israel. All the way until basically the end of the reign of the kings. There's only a couple more, a few more kings that come after Josiah, but not for very long time periods. And that's already when they're going captive into Babylon. So this is like the end of their, of their you know, golden era, if you will, of the kings of Israel ruling and reigning and having prosperity before judgment comes. And Solomon is what, the third king? I mean, you've got Saul and David and Solomon. So the, these, are, these are monuments and altars that have lasted for a long time. But you know what? It doesn't matter to the righteous king. It doesn't matter how long it's been in place. Because what's right is right, and what's wrong is wrong. And we're going to get rid of the things that are wrong, no matter how entrenched they are in our system and how historic they are. Oh, but these have been around. You know what? It's wicked. We're going to get rid of it. Right. Idolatry is wicked. I don't care how long it's been standing. It's not going to be in our land because God said not to have idolatry. So I don't care about the historical significance of things. We might as well just, just tear it all down. That's why I don't care when, you know, these monuments are getting destroyed either. When these, bra these, these graven images of man and graven and brazen images that are just erected up in this country and people are tearing them down, I go, good, tear them down and don't replace them with anything. We have books for history. I'm not saying get rid of history, but let's get rid of idolatry. We're not going to idolize people. We're not going to erect statues of people when God said not to do that. Get rid of it. But get rid of it for the right... I mean, get rid of it anyways, but I wish people could just see this is idolatry and that's why we're getting rid of it, not just, well, I don't, I don't like what this stands... You know, whatever. That's... So this is what the righteous King Josiah, which had already said, I started off saying, he did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. And all these things that we're seeing are all right in the eyes of the Lord. Driving out the sodomites, stopping the, the, the children being offered to Molech, 
tearing down the idolatry, all of this is right in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 14, he break in pieces the images and cut down the groves and filled their places with the bones of men. Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel and the high place which Jeroboam the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, had made. Both that altar and the high place he break down and burned the high place and stamped it small to powder and burned the grove. Jump down to verse number 20. The Bible says, And he slew all the priests of the high places that were there upon the altars and burned men's bones upon them and returned to Jerusalem. And the king commanded all the people, saying, Keep the Passover of the Lord your God as it is written in the book of this covenant. Surely there was not holding such a Passover from the days of the judges that judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel, nor of the kings of Judah. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, wherein this Passover was holding to the Lord, in Jerusalem. So basically saying there was not an event like this. I mean, people were keeping the Passover, right? But it was never exalted like this. It was never on the scale that King Josiah was. Why? Because there's excitement among the people of God when you've got a righteous king just getting everything right and going like, man, yeah, we're, we're changing this, we're changing this. And you know what? We're going to hold a Passover this year unto the Lord and we're going to give honor and glory unto the Lord and we've already been doing that with all of this stuff that we've been doing. And they're like, yeah. And, and it becomes a main focus of serving the Lord and honoring the Lord instead of just a side thing that, oh, yeah, we also do this. It's like, no, we're putting this front and center. Verse 24, moreover, the workers with familiar spirits and the wizards and the images and the idols and all the abominations that were spied in the land of Judah and Jerusalem did Josiah put away that he might perform the words of the law which were written in the book that Elkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. So he's honestly looking to the law of the Lord as his source, as his truth, as his guide. He's a wise king going, hey, this is what the law said, so we're not going to have these familiar spirits and wizards and, and um, you know, images and idols and all this junk. It's got to go. And a, and a righteous ruler is going to do that. And yes, you say, but the United States of America isn't a theocracy. Well, you know what? If we had a righteous ruler, this is what they would stand for. They would say, we need to get rid of the, the, the wizards and the enchantments and, the, and the, you know, all of this junk and magic and you know, whatever, the, the, the familiar spirits, the mediums. Like That just needs to go. The psychics, they need to go. It shouldn't be allowed. It should be against the law. It was against God's law. We're going to make it against the law. Sodomy should be against the law. It's against God's law. It should be against the law. Adultery should be against the law. It's against God's law. It's against the law. And that's what a righteous ruler is going to stand on. That's their platform. You say, we're going to make America righteous. Even if it was never righteous, we're going to make it righteous. That's what a righteous ruler would do. It sounds radical. Well, you know what? What Josiah was doing was radical too. Because look at all the things that were accepted in his time. All these things that were accepted, which is why God's bringing the judgment, which even after getting rid of this stuff, God's just saying, well, it's already too late. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you this time to clean things up so that you can have peace, Josiah, because I respect that and I will give you some peace in your time. But the judgment's still coming because you've, you know, the people have just gone too far anyways. So even looking for a Josiah, that's still not the answer. We're not waiting around for Josiah to pop up and run for president. You'll be waiting a long time if you expect that. And even if he did, it still isn't the solution. Verse uh, 25, And like unto him there was no king before him that turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might according to all the law of Moses. Neither after him arose there any like him. Notwithstanding, the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath wherewith his anger was kindled against Judah because of all the provocations that Manasseh had provoked him withal. There was none like Josiah. And even that wasn't enough. Right? And again, I'm going to get into that a little bit more this evening. And here's the thing we need to remember, though, because, again, I, I could already hear the objections going, whoa, well, that was just Israel. That's just the Lord judges the nations of the whole world. And he uses 
the, the rulers of the nations of the whole world. Nebuchadnezzar wasn't Israel. He didn't come from Israel. Pharaoh was, you know, king of Egypt. Okay, and Egypt got judged. The Canaanites got judged. The Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. Right? When we go back and read Leviticus, what does it say? Oh, yeah, God brought their judgment on them and wiped them all out because they did all the things that were contrary to God's law. But they weren't Israel. I know, but God still judges wickedness because it's wicked. You don't have to be his people for him to judge you because you're all his people. At the end of the day, you're all his creation. And God sets the rules for the whole world. And right is right and wrong is wrong for everybody. Regardless of where you were born, regardless of what skin color you are, regardless of any of that, there is one law for everybody. According to the creator, according to he that rules on high and sets up and brings down rulers as he will. It doesn't matter. The last place we're going to turn is Isaiah chapter 3. Isaiah 3. We're kind of ending on a downer. I was going to start with Isaiah 3, but I decided to end with Isaiah 3 instead. Because I think Isaiah 3 does a good job of describing the condition we're in today. And as we read it, you'll see why I think that way. And we're going to get it in context. This is going to be the last passage that we look at. This evening, I'm going to go more in-depth on the solution. Right, I don't want to just leave it just everything's doom and gloom, but I just want to make sure it's very clear that we're not looking to politics. We're not looking to political leaders to be our savior. That is not the answer. And I'm not going to get all upset and fret over who the ruler of our country is even a little bit. Even a little bit. Because the individual, God's able to take care of you. I'm going to keep focusing on what's right. But even on a macro scale, we're going to go into that more tonight on, on how could a whole group, how could a people be blessed of God? And what does it take? And what does it take from where we're at now? Look at Isaiah 3, verse number 1. The Bible reads, For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water. The mighty man and the man of war, the judge and the prophet and the prudent and the ancient, the captain of 50 and the honorable man and the counselor and the cunning artificer and the eloquent orator. So he's saying God's taking away all these. These are all good things, right? You've got the mighty man, judge, prophet, prudent people, you know, all these great things. Hey, you know what? I'm taking that away. I'm taking all these things away from you and I will give children to be their princes and babes shall rule over them. Now, I shouldn't even have to explain why this is a bad idea. But it goes back to, you know, wisdom being what's going to rule, what's going to be, give us good rulers. Babes don't have wisdom. Children don't have wisdom. They're babes, they're children. They need to learn, they need to grow, they need to understand more. You know, and, and I, you know, I don't want to get into all that, but you know, there's reasons why there's age limits set for the political offices and stuff in the country and why it was established that way. It's because once upon a time, you know, there was some level of integrity in wanting to have people who had wisdom become rulers and not just some kid who thinks they have all the answers just coming in and being real charismatic and just destroying things because they're fools and they don't really know anything. Unfortunately, we have a lot of old fools, too. But you're going to have a lot more likelihood of having someone who's wise when they're older than when they're young. And according to Scripture here, you know, this is, this is basically a curse. When God's taking away the good things and now he's saying, here's what I'm going to give you, this is a curse. So as we continue to read here, realize that these are curses that are coming upon, we're reading about the, you know, Judah and Jerusalem, but is applicable for the same reasons to any nation. Okay, you could do this to any nation. Verse 5, And the people shall be oppressed, everyone by another, and everyone by his neighbor. 
So the oppression's coming, not just from the rulers, but among the people. That's interesting. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient and the base against the honorable. And I, I'm starting to see this happening a lot more frequently with the younger generation just being completely disrespectful to the older crowd and thinking that they have all of the answers and they're really, really ignorant because they have no education. They're coming out of the, the public fool system that's just been teaching them propaganda instead of teaching them facts and reality by and large. So you've got, you've got children who think they know everything because they're children, don't realize that they have no wisdom, now have gotten to the point because there's no respect between children and adults anymore because that value has just gone out the window. And I think it's very soon that we're going to start seeing age restrictions being taken away and children becoming the rulers. But let's keep reading here because we already have other curses. Uh, verse number six, when a man shall take hold of his brother and of the house of his father, saying, Thou hast clothing, be thou our ruler, and let this ruin be under thy hand. In that day shall he swear, saying, I will not be an healer, for in my house is neither bread nor clothing. Make me not a ruler of the people. This is a day where no one wants to be ruler because things are so bad. Verse number eight, for Jerusalem is ruined and Judah is fallen because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. So that tells you exactly why they're in ruins. Why are things going so bad? Because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord. They're not even giving lip service to him, their tongue and their doings. It's all against the Lord. Verse number nine, the show of their countenance doth witness against them and they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. The tolerant society that we're living in today is allowing for the wicked to just declare their sin and just be like, what are you going to do about it? Accept us. Embrace us. We're here. We're wicked. We're declaring our sin as Sodom and there's nothing you can do about it and you need to accept it. They're not even ashamed. They're not even hiding it. You know, not that long ago, the, the queers were in the closet because society deemed it a shame you know, parents always ashamed if a, if a child, if a son or a daughter became a sodomite. Man, well, I wouldn't want anyone to know that. I don't want anyone to know that, this, that, that a child of mine became a pervert and a sodomite. It used to be a shame in our culture. Now it's just, hey, everybody, look at me. Hey, let's have a big parade. Hey, everybody, look at us. We're filthy. We're declaring our sin. There's no shame. This is why, this is what brings countries to ruin. This is what we see here. This is what the Bible says. People declaring their sin is Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul. Woe unto them. Verse 10. Say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Woe unto the wicked. It shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hand shall be given him. There's a silver lining. Hey, it's going to be well with the righteous. Even though there's all that wickedness around, it still doesn't change what you need to do from being righteous. So you know what? God will still bless you. He could bring judgment upon everybody, but still bless you individually. Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hand shall be given him. Verse 12. As for my people, look at this, children are their oppressors and women rule over them. And this is what we, you know, I was going to go a little bit more in depth on this, but we see, you know, the vice president now, the Kamala Harris, that's a woman in charge. We've got judges, we've got senators and Congress people and everything else. And look, it's not that I think women are stupid or couldn't even do a job. I go to what the Bible says. God has created men and women different. He didn't create women to be in those roles. Right. Bottom line. Right. And bottom line is, just as children are not meant to be rulers, and when you do, it's a curse, when women rule over you, it's a curse. Amen. It's not the position you want to be in. It's not right. You're putting things on their head. Just as much as a child ruling is like, man, that's backwards. They don't know enough to rule. 
Well, a woman, for different reasons, not just not because they don't know anything, because women can be just as smart as men, or you know that that's not the point. It's not intelligence. It's what did God design you for? God designed men to be rulers and 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 to be in charge and to be in positions of authority, and not women. That's the bottom line. And I'm not going to go any further on that because we could go all day in the scriptures behind that. But we see clearly here in Isaiah three that this is not a good thing to have women ruling over you. O oh, my people, they which lead thee, cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. So the leaders now, and look, who's setting these people up? God is. And they're causing you to err. But why did God even do this to begin with? Because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord. That's why. Because the people brought it on themselves, saying, okay, you want to forget me? You want to ignore me? You want to ignore my laws? Here you go. Here's your rulers now. Amen. Women and children are ruling over you and oppressing you. There you go. That's what you wanted. Verse 13, the Lord standeth up to plead and standeth to judge the people. The Lord will enter into judgment with the ancients of his people and the princes thereof. For ye have eaten up the vineyard, the spoil of the poor is in your houses. What mean ye that ye beat my people to pieces and grind the faces of the poor, saith the Lord God of hosts? So again, the, the wicked ancients here and these wicked rulers, they're oppressing the poor. And you know what? God's going to judge them. We have that going on now. God's setting them up. We have, we have poor people today being oppressed, being beaten down, being, you know. God is going to judge. God rights the wrongs. But it's a problem, all of this is a problem, not with the political leadership, but with the state of the people in their hearts and in their attitudes toward the Lord. That's where the problem lies. So just a sneak peek into tonight, guess where the solution lies? It's not in rallying behind some man to change government because that will do nothing nothing if people's hearts and minds are still just rejecting the Lord and rejecting his word it doesn't matter what laws are in place you're still going to go into bondage because sin brings people into bondage and when people set up their idols and set up their golden calves and set up the shrines to themselves, God's going to bring you low. God's going to abase every time. As far as I have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the wisdom that your word provides to us, a light unto our paths. God, I pray that you would please help us to have the right perspective on things in this world and not to get caught up in the fear mongering of, of the world and that you would help us to just walk in faith and not by sight, that we walk in the faith and the light of your word and that um, you will watch over us, you'll protect us, you'll defend us. Lord, help us to fight the good fight. Help us to do our part and to do what we're supposed to do and to live righteously, Lord. And, you know, I pray at least for your people that you'd, you'd uh, give us some relief and some respite here and that, and that we could continue to do your work um, without, without, facing the problems that, that, that wicked people want to, to bring our way, Lord, uh, and that you would just help us to get the work done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.